Well, good morning. It's so good to be among God's people this morning. Would you stand together with us? We welcome Facebook Live into this time of worship with us, and we're going to sing praise to our Almighty God. We sing praise to the glory of His grace because He has accepted us in the Beloved. That is Christ and Christ alone. So we praise Him. He is a good God. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. we worship him who is a great and an awesome God. You may be seated. Amen. We are here to worship the only true God. Amen. And we enter into his presence. The psalmist tells us we come into his courts and his gates with praise and thanksgiving. I hope you have a reason today not only to give thanks for what God's done in your life, some goodness, some grace you've experienced this week. But we also come to praise Him because there's no God like Him. He is the good God, the loving God, the merciful God, the gracious God. He is the almighty God. He is all of those things, infinite and beyond your contemplation. He, if you can put Him in a box, you don't know who He is. Amen? And so we praise Him and we magnify His name because His name has the weight and the worth of worship. And so that's what we're doing this morning Praise the Lord. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. I invite you to gather here on the altar this morning or there in the pew as we come before the Lord, praising him for who he is and thanking him for what he's done. Praying to him because you know what? We need to desperately pray for our nation. It is chaos. It is upheaval everywhere. And church, we have got to pray and intercede for our nation and that you and I will shine brightly as salt and light into this darkness that's out there. 
And beloved, we're not standing here wondering what's going on. We know what's going on. This is the effect of sin in the hearts of men and women and children. When people don't repent and don't acknowledge, there is an almighty God worthy of praise. There is an almighty God that we should give thanks to this morning. It is a culture that desperately needs the Lord. And so let's pray for her today. And they live around us. They live near us. We work with them. Let's intercede and pray for God to move in our land. As we're praying this morning, I want to remind you that God drew your boundaries in this day and in this age. He drew my boundaries in this day and in this age and in this land in which we live. And that is so that we will reach for God and invite others to reach for him. And why? Because he first reached for us. He reached for us on a cross to give his life for us. Jesus died for us and he offers salvation and redemption to any and all who come. And that's our prayer, that they'll know Jesus. So let's praise him this morning. Let's pray to him. Join with me as we pray. Almighty God and Father, we gather as your children this morning to celebrate your great and mighty name. There is no God like you. You alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of our attention. You alone are worthy of our whole being, Lord. You deserve our attention right now. So God, fix our attention on you. God, help us to see this world through your eyes. You created it, it fell away from you because of sin. But God, you loved it enough to send your son Jesus to die, to shed his blood, and to redeem lost mankind. Father, we represent those who have been redeemed. We praise you and thank you that you saved our souls. But God, we see a world around us that desperately needs Jesus. God, there is no peace because they do not know the one who is peace. There, there is no order. There is destruction, Lord God, because people do not surrender to the God who, who gives order to life. And God, we are here today to say, Father, we worship you and we will be salt and light and reflect your glory to this world around us. And God, empower us and embolden us to do just that. God, we thank you for the upcoming week, Lord, when we will attempt to sow seed in little children's hearts, Father. And in students' hearts and in adults' hearts, Lord. We, we consecrate this time, Lord. We're not just doing something traditional, God. We sincerely desire, Lord, to sow your seed in hearts. So, God, give us good soil this week in the hearts of children and students and adults. Bring them in. God, they've been cooped up. God, evidently, it's okay to protest. It's okay to go to the house of, the God, of God. God, bring them in so that we can minister to them. And we pray to see you change a nation and a land. And God, may our worship today be pleasing to you as we magnify your name and as we give thanks for your love that you showed us at Calvary. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said amen and amen. Amen. It's good to see you again in the house of the Lord. And perhaps you're visiting with us today. You're our special guest. And we always appreciate those who choose to worship with us here at South River Baptist Church. We'd like to identify you by asking you just to remain seated so that we can give you some information about our church. But also so that our church family can properly welcome you into the house of the Lord. And we do that every Sunday morning by asking our church family, our brothers and sisters, to stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. And then find our guest as well. And make them feel welcome in the house of the Lord. So South River family, stand this morning. Greet one another. Let your brother and sister know we're here to serve a great and mighty God and worship him. And make our guests feel welcome.
Well, let's gather back together. Guess you can go ahead and stand with us. Thank you for remaining seated so we can recognize you. Well, one of the things that we need to be reminded of from God's Word is that we win. Amen? Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. We win. We've read the back of the book, and we know that we win. And because He is coming again, He will cause all to bow down and worship Him to His Lordship. He is the one who roars as the King, as the Lion, but He also laid down His life as the Lamb, as our Redeemer, that celebrates our Almighty Savior this morning as we worship. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is Know he is Lord. Let's proclaim that. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Amen. Are you glad every knee will bow one day before him? That's true because it's written in his word. We know it because we bank and trust on the word of God. Everything we've known from him has been true, right? 
how he's redeemed us, how he's saved us. He's bought us back by his blood. And so he desires that we give testimony of that to others. And we do that by expressing in our hearts and our lives that we bow before his lordship and we look to his word. What happens when we open his word? What happens? God speaks. That's right. He speaks to our hearts. And so not only do we open his word and we read it, we read it together in the midst of our worship, but we open our hearts to his word and to his truth. And this truth that uh, Titus writes about in Titus chapter 1 speaks of God's work in the midst of a perverse generation and how he still desires for us to speak truth into a generation that is turning away from him. Let's read his word together and allow him to speak to us. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Doesn't that sound like our generation? It does. Even those who claim Christ, that sounds like that's true of those among us. But God would desire that we stand for truth and we understand that truth. Well, this song, as we go into worship, as we continue to worship, indicates that we don't want to be that generation. We bow our hearts before the Lord because we desire that He works in and through us and that He would be glorified as people of His truth. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. God, lift our souls to another. Oh, God, let us be a generation that sees, that seeks your face. Oh, God of Jacob. Oh, God, let us be a generation that sees, that seeks your face. This your prayer to the Lord this morning. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us clean hands, 
look to him in prayer. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, Lord, realizing that there's so much godlessness around us. People seek after evil and people desire to do evil and to live out what's true in their flesh. God, I pray that you will have heard the prayer of your people today right here in this place, right here in Statesville, North Carolina, out in the country here. God, that you would hear our cry, that you would allow us to be, to rise up as your people, as a generation who seeks your face and seeks your will and your glory to be done on this earth. Thank you, Lord that we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, taught his disciples to pray, that things will be true on earth as they are in heaven. And you receive all the glory in heaven. We desire you receive the glory here. And Lord, may we bow our knees. May we bow our hearts to you as we worship. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had today to sing these truths back to you. And now as we give today, may we give glory and praise to you because of your amazing grace. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we give today, right here in this place, you have the opportunity on Facebook Live to give as well as the river still flows. Victory, whom shall I? 
Thank you, praise team. Praise the Lord. We are never alone. Amen. God is always there for us fighting our battles. And children, you're going off to Children's Church to learn, learn wonderful truths like that from Pastor Stephen. And we're going to take our copy of God's Word this morning and discover why we need to know the God of angel armies. Why we desperately need to know that He is with us and we're never alone. And how to understand what's going on in our day and in our age. If you have your copy of God's Word, be turning to the book of Proverbs as you're turning there to this book of wisdom as we need for wisdom for day today to understand our generation and what's going on. You know, Tom Brokaw wrote a book several years ago about the greatest generation of people. They came of an age of the Great Depression and before the Second World War, and they went on to build modern-day America. And when they built it, uh, they did it through sacrifice and with honor and achievement. And uh, they gave us the courage which we once had, but today you wonder what's happened to our land. Because when you read their lives, you realize they were willing to sacrifice. Uh, they didn't whine about their patriotism. Uh, they didn't take for granted uh, what was going on around them. They made something of the life that they were given. And what they birthed and gave us is a great nation and yet you see the seed that's come from them and where it is today. And you wonder, was it worth all the sacrifice? Well, of course it was. But they were the greatest generation, as Brokaw writes about them. But you really have to ask yourself, what has happened in our day and in our age? And what generation are we now a part of? We all belong to a generation. Some of y'all are builders and boomers. Some of us are Gen X and Gen Y and Gen Z and mosaics or whatever you want to call them. Every generation is, is, is identified by the music and fads and inventions and innovations that happened during that particular period of time. But you have to wonder, what generation would you call this generation today? The one that you and I see on the screens of TV and read about on the Internet, the ones that are making such news today in the streets of our nation. And you might want to ask, what kind of generation is this? Because you have to ask yourself, what's it going to be like in another 10 years, in another 20 years? And so as you and I wrestle with our Christian faith in a post-Christian culture, how, how does our faith survive? How do we continue to go forward and battle for righteousness and stand for that which is true? How do we do that faithfully and consistently in the day and age in which we live. America is in 
no longer the great generation, is not among us. We now are a godless generation. You see it, the lawlessness on the streets. You hear people calling in and uh, bl casting blame on, on every government and governing official. Uh, different elements within the government are at blame. One individual does something and that somehow represents all of those individuals. For example, law enforcement. Something is wrong in our land. And America doesn't understand the truth because you know what? They've turned away from the source of truth. If we look in the word of God this morning because this is our truth source. And this explains what's going on to us. We know that righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. The secret to our success has always been righteousness as a nation. Uh, when sin is rampant and running rampant in the hearts of people, you see it running rampant in the streets of America. And that is a godless generation that has not surrendered to the Lord who has provided something for their sin. When you listen to the radio, you and I need to begin taking our, our, those thoughts that are coming through there captive to the knowledge of the Word of God, to the knowledge of who God is in the commands of Christ. Because, you see, there are a lot of those that are pontificating the, the, the reason for all the problems, and they're taking it from Marxist ideology, a godless ideology, and they are projecting that now on, in all of their ads, and they are actually they are telling corporations that they need to wake up and be woke. All of that is Marxist ideology, church, and that is a godless atheistic ideology and that is what is happening in our land today. And unless we stand up and speak, we'll be given over to it. If you want to understand what's happening in our generation, you see clearly it is a godless generation. And in the book of Proverbs chapter 30, the prize man writes about this generation and details what they look like and the characteristics of them and how you clearly identify them. But it's also the book of Proverbs which shows us how you minister to a godless generation. And perhaps how South River has must embrace our opportunity to minister where God has drawn our boundaries and to be more effective in it, more intentional in it, and to seize these opportunities and not cower in fear or walk away without faith. We go forward boldly because we know who our God is, we go forward boldly because we know the truth of God's word. We go forward boldly because we know the end story. And because we realize that we're going to engage a godless generation with the only thing that can change it. Stand with me in honor, word of the Lord, as we read these characteristics of a godless generation as the wise man identifies them. And when you read this, you'll see them right there as though you're watching Fox News or clicking on your favorite internet link. Verse 11 of chapter 30. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords, whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Father in heaven, speak to us from your word. God, may we hear this description of the generation that no longer fears you or has regard for you. And may we as the people that do fear you and reverence you. May we embrace this opportunity to not run, not hide, to not stick our head in the sand, but God, to stand the line and engage them. God, may we embrace the truth that Jesus said that the gates of hell cannot stop the advance of the gospel and that we need to go forth and engage them. And Lord, we ask this today in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and coming King. Amen. Amen. You may be.
seated. Proverbs is painting a comprehensive picture of a depraved and decadent society in which individuals no longer fear God. They are godless. And this is the nation, not only that we live in, listen church, this is the nation that we minister to. We don't draw the boundaries and run from them. We know God can change things. We believe that. He has done that time and time again throughout the history of man. But you and I must have faith to go forward and engage them and share with them the only thing that can change their lives. We live in a generation that has many social ills. Every generation has had social ills. This is nothing new. Every generation has some, had some issue, something that they have had to deal with. But the major thing that we are facing today is when those ills are defined by an ideology that has no regard for God. You must be taking things and filtering it in through the truth of who God is and what God's word said, rather than listening to the opinions and the political blather that's going on out there. You must be discerning in this day and age and realize that the Bible tells us why this is happening and what is going on. And the Bible also tells us what the answer is to it and why we don't just embrace whatever this ideology is telling us to do. If we do that, we will have no worship of God at some point. Go look at the Marxist, fascist cultures around the world and there is no regard for God nor his people. And that's the danger that our nation faces. As you consider these four characteristics this morning, we also want to consider what is God telling us that we should be doing and why is it that we do even vacation Bible school? Why is it that we say, no, we're going to have the children come in again this year and we're going to pour the word of God into their hearts? Why is it that causes us to shape the ministries that we do? Why is it that we support our pastors going into the schools and engaging the children that are there? Why is it that you should embrace that opportunity as well to serve tonight and throughout this week and in all these other ministries where we're trying to engage the culture around us? We've done church for too long just staying within the building and not getting out of the building and going and intentionally engaging the culture around us. And we have to realize you have to do church differently. It's not enough merely to say me and mine are taken care of and we got our little country club here of spirituality and that's enough. America will fall if the church doesn't wake up. That's the truth. Well, what does this culture look like and how do we engage it? Well, first, he says that a godless generation despises authority. Specifically, they despise their parents' authority. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. This self-sufficient generation has no indebtedness to their parents. They see no need to honor nor obey mom or dad. And isn't that surprising? Because the first commandment that had a promise of blessing was the one where children honor mom and dad. You remember that? Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you might live long days. In fact, under the law, when children did not honor and obey their parents, that was the sin that, like blasphemy, had the same judgment. Death. You say, whoa, that's pretty serious. Why would it be that way? Well, you see, parents are God's authority in a child's life, even when the child doesn't like it. We've raised a generation where parents have thought they're just their kid's best friend, not the authority that God has given them as his representative in that child's life. Why is that so significant? Why is that so important? If a child doesn't learn to submit to the parent's authority in the home, most likely they will not submit to other authorities outside of the home. They will not surrender their will as they ought to, to the Lord ultimately, as the parents are his representative. 
What is the cure for a generation that does this when they reject parental authority and have no regard for it? Well, the cure is found all throughout the book of Proverbs. As parents discipline and disciple tenderly, earnestly, carefully, consistently, they pray to God pleading and believing that God can change the heart. They diligently do this, acting prudently. That's why we encourage dads, shepherd your home. Pastor Scott, Pastor Stephen are not the shepherds only for your children's hearts. Dads and moms, you are. And we are here to stand alongside you and help you and encourage you and equip you and say, listen, we're here to assist you to do what God has called you to do. We're not your surrogates. We're not taking your place. You have that responsibility and are accountable to God one day for it. So embrace it and do it. And realize the best thing you can do sometimes is, listen, not be your kid's best friend, but be God's representative authority in their lives, even when they don't like it. And let's be honest, all of us that raise kids can raise our hands and say, you know what, it's hard. There are times that, you know what, man, they, they buck, right? And they butt heads. And they're testing the boundaries. And that's when you have to double down and realize this is God's calling on your life, on my life, and we must be faithful to do it. Because when we don't, you see what's happening on the streets today and the rejection of authority, God's given authority in places, and you wonder, well, I wonder where it all began. It began in the home. A godless generation rejects parental authority. They have no regard for it. And as a result, they are ripe for divine judgment. Watch this. If you look in verse 1, there is a generation, or verse 11, that curses its father and does not bless its mother. And then you look down in verse 11, the, or verse 17 rather. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out and the young eagles will eat it. This is a description of God's judgment of those who do not respect authority. This is what they can expect. Those eyes who scorn mom and dad, those mouths that mock them and have no regard for them, their hearts are ripe for the judgment of Almighty God. That's the severity of it. That's why we speak to it. We realize it. it, it the right thing for us to do is to equip moms and dads to shepherd their children and then as a church to realize that sometimes we've got to go out and reach the children because moms and dads aren't doing that and pour God's truth into them and try to reach moms and dads as we do that. That's why we do vacation Bible school. That's why we reach out for the children because we realize this is not what's happening. It's why we do Good News Club. It's why we do ministry, table talk in the schools as they allow us to do that. It's why we go because we realize it's not happening and we must teach them. You can ask Pastor Scott as he's gone into the schools time and time again how many kids, when he offers them a Bible, they are amazed that they have a Bible because they've never seen one. They've never had it open to them, read to them, explained to them. And this is the severity of it. When we lose the home, you lose the foundation for the nation. You lose you rip apart the home and you rip apart the fabric. And Satan wants to rip apart the home so that children don't respect mom and dad, don't regard them, don't honor them. It is a sign of a decadent society that has turned its back on God and is godless. And the danger is this. You and I must beware of a generation that curses the parents. We need to be aware of what's going on. Not only are they those who uh, despise authority, but also they're defiled. This is what it says in verse 12. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it's not washed from its filthiness. Now, that why is it pure in its own eyes, and yet still nasty and defiled? Well, see, this is a generation that laughs at sin. They wade deeper and deeper into the waters of wickedness and their hearts grow darker by the day. Why is that the case? Because there's no moral standard. 
that there is moral relativism. In other words, when you no, no longer listen to God's authority in your life, and you no longer listen to their instruction as they teach you that there are boundaries in life that you have to stay in for your safety, that there are boundaries that you need to stay in so you can be blessed. When that happens and children reject that authority, they reject the moral authority that goes along with that God. And what happens then is they want to be right in their own eyes. And that's what you see all around us. We have left the one moral standard that is given by God, found in His Word, in accordance with His holy nature. And as a result, instead of there being absolutes, moral absolutes, because the culture to say there's absolutely no moral absolutes, they're absolutely sure of it. What has happened today then is you lose the one plumb line that tells us what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is true and what is false. And what happens then is every individual begins to define for themselves what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, what is true. And who are you to tell them then that they're wrong? And that is what is being played out on the streets all around us. That listen, there is no longer uh, any moral standard and what happens is you are unable to confront them and tell them they are wrong. You see, if God were at the center of their life, they would understand that God is holy. They would understand that there is things that are wicked and evil, and there are things that are good and are true. They would understand that we're to loathe sin and wickedness, and we're to pr pursue righteousness and to live for that. We're supposed to live as pure hearts and pure eyes looking unto the Lord and trusting in Him, realizing that only God can change our life. And so what we have to do is begin to help parents realize that, you know what, we've got to reintroduce to many that there is a moral standard for life, and it comes from the Word of God, and it's a reflection of the God that we worship and that we serve. You see, beware of that generation that is corrupt. You realize that the heart is exceedingly wicked, Jeremiah says. It will deceive us. It will lie to us. It will say, oh yeah, you're really good. And the way that it says that oftentimes is just consider so-and-so. Just compare yourself to so-and-so. Today, what do we have? We have children that, listen, grow up and no longer know there is a right and a wrong, a good and an evil. They want to define it for themselves. We don't want to, we don't want to hurt them. Or what do they do? They claim they're victims, right? And they don't want to take responsibility for their actions. And who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? Don't you know what I was raised in? Listen, the problem is not outside of us. The problem is inside of us. It's called sin. And the Word of God explains that and teaches that. But when you raise a, a generation where indi every individual defines what is right and wrong, and who, then the question is, who's right? And that's what they're saying today. Don't push your cultural norms, they'll say, over on me. Who are you to? That's your definition of what is right and wrong. That doesn't affect me. That is what is happening today on our streets. Not only are they despising authority, they are also defiled. They think they're clean, but they're not. You know what? They're as filthy as the one beside them, and they're unwilling to acknowledge it. And it's only when you come into the light of the Lord that you realize just how wretched you are. And that's what's happened. They don't realize it any longer. They're also a generation that is godless and they are devilishly proud. There is a generation, verse 13, oh, how lofty are their eyes! Exclamation point. Their eyelids are lifted up. The, the picture that you have here is, is now you can't tell them anything. Because they're absolutely certain that they are right and that their standards are right. And so what happens is this just emboldens this selfish pride that they cannot be confronted. They are their own gods. And isn't that what Satan wanted to be? And when he was there over the, as a cherubim with the, uh, over the throne of God leading worship. And he said, I want to be God as he was flying there. And God said, I don't think so, not in my lifetime. And so like him, that is what they do. 
This is the temptation that happened to Eve. You can read about it over in Genesis chapter 3. When the devil came and tempted her as the serpent. And there she was tempted and Adam was tempted to eat from the tree. Uh, of which God had said, thou shalt not eat from. And it says there in Genesis that when Eve uh, was tempted, she saw that the tree was good and able to make one wise. So she reached and took. The picture there that the author wants us to see, Moses wants to see, is she saw what was good. She wanted to define what was good in her eyes. Because God had already said it's not good. And yet she wanted to define it for herself. And that's what's happening all around us. Proud eyes, selfish eyes, make you help, help you to realize that they think they're gods. They think they, they, they rule their world. And in some ways, we've allowed them to do it because we've not been the parental authority, the godly authority in their lives, and we allow them to find their lives for themselves. And we need to realize that's who we're ministering to. When the kids come in for vacation Bible school, we don't look at them and say, oh, you devilish little imp. No. We graciously love them and help them to realize that our hearts are exceedingly wicked. And that's why Jesus came to die for us. And we need to surrender to him and accept his sacrifice and put our faith and trust in him. And surrender to him our wills. Because our will, if we follow it, will destroy us. That's what we have to do. That's why we do these ministries. You see... Instead of having lofty eyes and raised eyebrows, when you come into the presence of the Lord and you're not godless but you're God-fearing, you become humble. And humble eyes don't raise themselves to look at self. Humble eyes look to the Lord. And they look to the cross and they realize how wretched we are. And that there's nothing good in us. That's why we need Jesus. And so a God-centered generation will be humble and will be marked by the humility of their master who was willing to die for us on a cross of suffering and shame. A God-centered generation realizes that God tears down the proud heart, but gives grace to the humble. That's why we have humble hearts and humble eyes. And we look up in faith and we say, I didn't deserve it. Oh, but how many of you love me. And look at how you've blessed me and graced me. You see, sadly today, if you try to tell this generation that they're wrong in their pride, they're not going to be willing to surrender and submit to that authority in their lives. They're devilishly proud. And you should beware of a conceited generation. And then finally it says, a godless generation is destructive. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords, whose fang are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Their teeth are like swords and knives. The picture there is, is their appetites are destructive. They want to destroy. That's all they desire to do. They're cruel oppressors. And they, they, they're greedy for gain. And all they want to do is devour the afflicted. What's amazing is if you go over to Proverbs chapter 1, what you find there in chapter 1, when you discover the beginning of the path of wisdom, which is a step of holy fear in chapter 1, verse 7. The first two lessons that moms and dads are supposed to be teaching their children are this. First, surrender to the right authority in your life by listening, hearing the instruction of your father, and not forsaking the law of your mother, for they will be grace, a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. That's not chains that enslave you. That's chains that are like a gold chain or something, a pendant that reflects goodness and grace and glory and favor. That's the first lesson. Well, the first lesson is take a step of fear because of what Deuteronomy 6 says. But the second lesson is respect mom and dad and the authority that God has given them in your life and learn to submit to what they're teaching you and bend your will to them and ultimately to God. And learn to live your life that way. The next lesson is verses 10 through 19 of chapter 1. And what does that say? Well, when sinners entice you, when they come and say, Come with us and let us lie in wait to shed blood and lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. 
We shall find all kinds of precious possessions and fill our houses with spoil. Cast your lot in with us and, and let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot far from their path, for their feet run to be evil. You see, from an early age, mom and dad, and grandma and grandpa, you're supposed to be in reinforcing what mom and dad are teaching them. Reinforcing that. Uh, if you don't know, believe that, go read Deuteronomy chapter 6, which says that you're to teach your son and your grandson to fear the Lord and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have responsibility to multiple generations. Just because you become an empty nester doesn't believe mean that, you know what, you're done. You can throw your hands up, I'm done. I can go relax. You still have great influence. Use it. Use it for the gospel. Use it to teach them to fear the Lord and reverence Him and be blessed as they surrender their will to Him. And you need to reinforce, we need to reinforce what moms and dads are teaching them, particularly when they are tempted with peer pressure to go run with this crowd to be very careful and realize, as it says there in Proverbs chapter 1, that they set the snare for themselves. And ultimately, they will get don't run with them. Those that are destructive, they have dangerous, destructive appetites. They're greedy for gain, and they take it from the poor and the needy. You know what's amazing? You see those that legitimately had a protest, something they want to protest, mingled in with them were anarchists who have nothing more than want to destroy this nation. Then you have those that are coming in looters, who have no desire other than what can I get out of this? If I was a protester and I really wanted to protest the, and, 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 and do what the Constitution allows us to do, to assemble peacefully, that's what it says, peacefully, then you know what? I would tell those, get out of our protest. You who want to destroy, you who want to burn, you, wanna, you who want to loot, you who want to take lives, get out of here. Because what happens now is the whole thing just looks to be destructive. And what the original purpose was is gone. And even now, that is being taken over by this woke ideology, this Marxist ideology that does nothing but destroy ultimately. If you don't believe me, just go look at Venezuela if you like Marxism if you think that's something we should embrace. Because what was a once prosperous nation is now a shambles of a nation. This is what's going on around us. Beware of a generation that is combative and destructive and wants to destroy. That's godlessness. The, all of this demonstrate that God is not the center of people's lives. He's not even in their way of thinking any longer. Now, what do we do? What's our responsibility as the church? You see, we should be living even brighter to this culture that's around us right now. You and I should be shining brightly because we are not godless. We are God-fearing and we surrendered our lives to Him. What we realize is, is, you know what? There needs to be a time where, you know what? You're on the altar praying to Almighty God. Father, we're reaping what we have sown. Forgive us as a nation. Forgive us as a culture that has destroyed life and murdered innocent life for 45 years, and now no one has regard for any aspect of life. That's what's happened. We no longer fear God. Forgive us, Lord, where the church has isolated itself and insulated itself instead of engaging those around them. Realize this, that according to Paul, writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says in the last generation that children will be there will be many signs about that generation, but one of them is that they will be disrespect, disrespectful to fathers and to mothers. Now, that's, a, that's not, you know, let's be honest. Anyone who's raised kids knows there's time when kids are disrespectful, and we correct them. But Paul is talking about a heart that has no regard at all for moms and dads and despises them. That's the generation that the wise man Solomon wrote about right here. You see... The answer for this godless generation is that there be a grace generation that seeks to redeem it. 
those who've been recipients of God's grace. Because once we were like this, some of us, we acted in these ways. Some of us were pure and undefiled. We thought no one could tell us we were doing wrong. Some of us had destructive lifestyles. Some of us were proud and arrogant. And yet the grace of God came and reached our hearts and changed us. And now you and I need to take the same message that can change a godless generation and go to them. That's why we do Vacation Bible School. That's why we do other ministries. And see, what's amazing here is we know the answer is in the Word of God. You see, look over at the beginning of this chapter 30. Where the words of Agur, the son of Jacob, his utterance that he spoke. Look in verse 2. What's the problem? Well, he speaks it right here. Surely I am more stupid than any man and do not have the understanding of a man. Why? I have neither learned wisdom nor do I have knowledge of the Holy One. That's the problem. They don't know who God is and they want to make themselves God. Can I just tell you right now, you don't realize this because you, unless you really study and understand and have taken time, we see what's happening on the screens and we, we just soak it in, soak it in, soak it in. But until you go and read the documents of many of the critical leaders that are pushing this woke ideology and realize some of them have ties back to the 1960s and the weather underground, and you realize the founding documents and what they wanted to do, it's playing out on the streets right now as they want to get rid of systemic racism, as they want to get rid of law enforcement. Have you heard that anywhere? We need to get rid of law enforcement. Oh, by the way, one of the other six tenets that they had is they wanted to dethrone God. They are, they are satanic, whether they realize it or not, they are pawns in Satan's hands, and what they want to do is destroy they want to be the absolute authority because they don't want to surrender to God's absolute authority. And that is their documents that, they, that now fuel what they're doing. And you can read about it if you want to know really what's going on. Now, they're not going to broadcast that to everyone. Oh, no, they're going to co-opt this whole thing so that they can bring about the change that needs to take place. Beloved, the church needs to wake up today and needs to be engaged and needs to be speaking the truth and engaging them. And until we do that, beloved, if we don't do it, it's all going down. It's all going down. We win the battle on our knees first. We win the battle crying out to Almighty God to have mercy on our nation and to stir the hearts of those who are complacent right now in their churches. For God to wake them up to realize, plead, plead, plead to God to change the hearts and lives of those around you. Pray for God to reveal the truth about those who are behind all of this to expose them so that they can be brought to justice. Because there is a thing called justice. And there is a thing called law and order, and we desperately need it. No society can survive without it. Also realize the truth about the gospel, the truth about grace, and why we do this. You see, when we read the word of God, we realize the truth about who God is and who we are. And when we realize that, we realize we need to repent and place our faith and trust in Christ and for Him to transform our lives. Only God can fix this. The government cannot fix this. Not with some new program, not with reallocation of, of finances uh, away from the police department to all these other things that will not change the hearts of men. How many government programs have we had and it hasn't solved it? Only God can change the hearts. And only God can change the nation. You see, there was a great hymn we used to sing. I love the cross of Jesus. It tells me who I am. A vile and guilty creature saved only through the Lamb. No righteousness nor merit, no beauty can I plead. Yet in the cross of glory, my title there I read. You see, when we come to the cross, we realize we are vile, wretched sinners and we deserve death. 
But God had mercy on us. And when you've received the grace of God, then as Paul told Titus, because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to man, why has he done that? To do this. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What transforms lives and teaches us how to live? The grace of God. Found only in Christ. To turn away from ungodliness and worldliness and to live right in the eyes of God. That's why we do what we do here. We don't just do church. We don't just do a southern tradition. Beloved, we're here because the grace of God has transformed our lives. And we know that's the only thing that will change the lives of those around us. And they desperately need it. That's why we're going to do what we're going to do this week. That's why we need some of you to come and help us to be just shepherds and help us shepherd children from one room to the next. And as we're there, pray over them as you see their name tags. God, I pray for this little heart that's before me as they're listening to the truth as someone else is teaching them. Dear God, give them fertile soil right now so that the seed can be planted. And for this one, Lord, that I've seen here year after year after year after year after year, God, water that seed that we've planted in their lives. For this one that came because, you know what, they were in our, in our good news club up at Central School. Dear God, they're here tonight, and Lord, I want to pray over them while they're here. And I pray, God, that you would just speak to them so that their lives will be changed. And God, I, maybe you're just shepherding them. All you're doing is making sure, you know what, that it's not total chaos. As we move them from room to room, and as we... Pour out the truth of God's word in them. Maybe you're praying over those names right there for their parents who may not be in the house of God but desperately need to be in the house of God. And then when they come and pick them up, you can say to mom and dad, man, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. I hope I get to see you come on Sunday. Or by the way, we have an adult class. You might want to check it out. It's really good. And you know what? It'll give you some truth that'll change your life. This is why we do what we do. Now, it's easy. Just to sit on the pew and say, oh, I've done my part. I don't have to do it anymore. We've done that for too long. We've sat on our hands and done nothing. Church, we've got to be engaged. And you know what's even more amazing? In this day, in this age, when too many have listened to the governor and Pharaoh's edict that we can't gather, which, oh, by the way, he can still go protest with the protesters without social distancing and all that. Come on. Wake up and realize they've lied to you. They've not told you the truth. Because if they really believed it, then they'd practice it. And what's happened is we've taken this hook, line, and sinker, and our culture is suffering because of it. And so many churches are not engaging any longer. And if you're one of the few that does, then you better do it even more because you've got to pick up the slack of those who haven't done it. We're going to cancel vacation Bible school all across churches. And, and forgive me, I'm not shaming them, but I'm saying stop and think what's going on. And realize you're losing the opportunity to change the culture around you. And they made all these decisions based on lies. Models that aren't true. And they've not taken back any of it. And they said, oh, I'm mad right now. Excuse me. Forgive me, Lord. I don't want to have the right spirit. But let me say this. Your life is not to be governed by lies. But by the truth of God's word. And church, unless we wake up, it's going down. And they want nothing more, many of them who are behind this, for it to go down. Because their thought is, well, we'll have the answer to fix it. And we'll have the power. And then we'll really be in control. That's what they want to do. Now we can sit back and be silent. Or you can engage in battle. The gates of hell can't stop the gospel from going forward. You know who the most dangerous person in America is? It's not the looter. It's not the rioter that are on the streets burning down buildings, stealing, stabbing police with knives. Oh, those aren't the most dangerous people. You know the most dangerous person in America really will be? The one who sold out for Jesus Christ. No, we're not going to destroy lives. We're actually going to seek to build lives up. And when you realize that nothing can stop you, the gates of hell can't stop you, 
Man, you go forward bold in faith. That's a dangerous person. You know why? Because the devil don't want that one on the streets. He does not want that individual engaging children and students and parents and telling them God can change your life. The gospel can change your life. Jesus can transform your life. And yet the only hope for this godless generation is grace. And you and I who are trophies of grace and have experienced it need to go take that message to those around us. Some of y'all need to become agent provocateurs. And I'm not talking about those who stir up strife and destruction and cause mayhem and chaos on the streets. I'm saying, you know what? You've been graced and you get a little bit bolder. And you tell people around you, this is the answer that we need today. Church, God help us. That we'll respond and realize now is our time to stand in the gap. Let's do it and let's be faithful. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We need to make decisions today.